um, so uh, we've been looking at um, the different methods that the different schools of thought use in order to explore different areas of uh, subtle or non-ordinary consciousness. And this morning we looked at the way that we work with it, that you can work with the shamanic journey to uh, begin to step into the numinous world of the power of nature that is uh, the, uh, the unseen power of nature that's just behind the forms of nature. And then this afternoon, Bob gave a talk on a couple of aspects of tantric practice, which are essential to the acidic path. So that, that's where we've kind of been. And <clears throat> this evening is actually meant to be a question and answer period for all of the material or any of the material that we've covered so far. And um, if you, um, I wanted to see if anyone has any questions from anything that we've covered so far. Anyone? Yes. Yes. Today? Yesterday. Yesterday? I don't know when. <laughs> <laughs> I know, time moves, time changes. It must have been today. But you mentioned something about the energy drain. An energy drain? An energy drain. I was yes. wondering if you could go more deeply into that at some point. Sure, uh, I can talk about that. So that's power loss, yes. right? So in shamanic forms of healing, um, there is an understanding that most imbalance arises from four or five different sources. And all of those sources have uh, origination in the world of spirit. And um, you can have an imbalance that is... Uh... Hi, sorry, Mr. Sir. Sure. Mm -hmm. You're the about me? You're the about me? Okay. Oh, I need a blanket for my throat. Okay. So we're, we're, we're answering some questions, and I'm asking a question about power loss right now. And that's okay. your question. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Sure. Um, so um, in shamanic forms of healing, can you hear me okay, Bob? Should I put on my mic? I can hear now? you. Can you hear me? Sure. Um, in shamanic uh, forms of healing, and just for those of you that are new to the class, shamanism is... Um, a um, centerpiece of most cultures that have ever been on the planet. And the practices of shamanism center around healing, uh, problem solving, the guiding of the souls of the dead, um, divination. These are the kinds of activities that shamans will participate in with the help of what in shamanism are called helping spirits, which are basically compassionate forms of energy. So, um, um, so we're talking about when we're talking about shamanism. That's that's what we're talking about. So, um, within shamanic understandings of sickness, you find extremely in a in a very extremely widespread way this concept of power loss as a source of imbalance. And um, there are other sources of imbalance that, are, that affect the spirit are soul loss, energetic interference, soul part exchange. <coughs> There's more, but those are the primary ones. And as I was saying, when Bob came in, it's understood that in shamanic practice, if you have a uh, disturbance on a physical level, such as an autoimmune problem, or if you have a disturbance on a mental level, such as an obsessive compulsive kind of process, or if you have a, an imbalance on an emotional level, such as a depression, um, it's under, or if you have a spiritual crisis, you know, you've had a strong dream and you don't understand its nature, it's understood in shamanic practice that no matter where those manifestations are occurring, the imbalance 
begins on the spirit level. And the processes of power retrieval, which is an antidote for power loss, the process for soul retrieval, which is an antidote for soul loss, the process of the removal of energetic interference, which is a um, process of uh, being an antidote to energetic interference, disturbance, and soul part exchange, <coughs> which is the process of taking back parts of yourself that other people may have or that or giving back parts of other people that you may have, all which creates all kinds of problems that are the basis for a lot of relationship disruption. So um, if, if it's understood that <clears throat> if you work on this level with these processes, if you work on the spirit level with these processes, the manifestations of the different problems that are happening on the other level will weaken and ultimately resolve. So power loss, so I'm telling you all of that to be able to talk about power loss. So power loss is one of the most common sources of imbalance. And the truth is that most people are walking around in a state of power loss. And power loss occurs when you have been exposed to a situation or a circumstance which is uh, draining to you. So for instance, you could have a boss that doesn't see you or understand your gifts and doesn't allow you to express yourself in your workplace. And you can you know, feel this sense of lack of accomplishment, lack of fulfillment. There's this kind of power loss that sets in there. You could have a critical parent who tells you, no, I don't know why you're bothering to live because you should die anyway. You know, these <laughs> kinds of messages that people unfortunately do hear. Um, and, you know, some iteration of that's less dramatic than that, but can also cause <coughs> power loss. Or you could also have an, like an internal critical voice. And this is a source of a lot of power loss in the West. We were talking this afternoon about this kind of disease that Westerners have that, um, you know, other, you know, sh practitioners from other cultures, both shamanic and otherwise, don't really understand. And this, this idea of this, this kind of negative, self-critical voice, you know, you know, you should have worn that dress, I told you to wear that dress, and now you're sitting here looking like a fat cow, you know, that, you know, that voice, you know. Um, I mean, maybe it doesn't say exactly that to you, but it says something like that to you. That internal critical voice is a source of a lot of power loss. So, um, and it's understood that this power loss is at the, at, it's, it's, it's one of the fundamental causes or contributors to addiction because most people are using the substance to try to fill up, uh, uh, try to feel better. Uh, from the sense of power loss that is occurring. And you can also, uh, you know, people uh, can have attention problems. They can have, um, uh, they can have the mild anxiety. These, these are the kinds of symptoms that indicate some kind of power loss. And so from a shamanic point of view, the way that power loss is ameliorated is that the shaman goes, welcome, welcome, that the shaman goes outside of time through the vehicle of the shamanic journey, which is what we learned to do here in class today, and uh, goes with, uh, to uh, the place where they have this connection in non-ordinary reality with a compassionate field of energy that in shamanic practice is called a helping spirit, which, and these helping spirits in shamanic practice take the forms of nature. They could be in the form of a tree or an animal or a plant of some kind. And this, this helping spirit then goes with the shamanic practitioner outside of time to find the source of power that is going to ameliorate the power of the particular type of power loss this person is experiencing. And so the shaman is not actually doing the work. The shaman is asking the helping spirit, where do we need to go to find this power? And the helping spirit takes the shamanic practitioner 
further into the journey, they go to a place where they, where the source of power is presented to them, and the source of power could take the form of an animal. It could take the form of uh, some, uh, you know, a group of stars or jewels. It could, you know, you don't know exactly what form the power that uh, is needed will take, but it will take a form that has meaning to the person who's experiencing the power loss. And then the shamanic practitioner gathers that power and brings it back into ordinary reality, coming out of the journey, and then blowing that power into the energy system of the person experiencing the power loss. And people generally experience, <clears throat> they can have a lot of different kinds of experiences as a result of a power retrieval, <coughs> but generally people uh, feel um, more solid or um, you know, more grounded, more present. And um, in traditional shamanic practice, Everything I describe is what is done. In applied shamanism, which is the form of shamanic practice that I teach, I really try to incorporate the client's, or the patient's participation more fully. In traditional practice, shamans pretty much do all the heavy lifting, and the patients are pretty passive. <clears throat> but in applied shamanism, we have a process whereby, for instance, with the power retrieval, we do everything that we've talked about, but then we take the client through a hypnotherapeutic process, a lightly guided uh, meditation, where they can connect with the source of power that has been brought back to them and ask questions of the source of power. You know, you know, what, you know what, what can I do to integrate you better in my life? What gifts do you bring? And then the, the person establishes an intimate relationship with this source of power and can work with it over time to continue ameliorating and gathering, ameliorating the state of power loss and gathering more power. So they're, they're not dependent on the shaman, you know, telling them this is what happened and that's it. You know, it's the, the person is much more engaged in their healing. And, that level of engagement is what really heals. You know, it's, um, you know, for years I've worked with Barbara Brennan, um, who's a wonderful energy medicine healer. I'm sure many of you here on the East Coast know her. And one of the things that we used to notice is, you know, we would be doing, you know, energy medicine is at the heart of all shamanic practice. It's also at the heart of tantric Buddhist practice. And one of the things that I w we would all see is that we could work using light and sound to bring a person's energy system into <coughs> balance. But, but because of the way that, that they were working, the patient was very passive. So you do all this work, get the energy system balanced, and they would get up off the table, and the old pattern of running energy would reassert itself immediately because the person was not understanding why they were in the state of power loss or the state of energy depletion that they were in at the time. And so everything that we do with applied shamanism, integrated energy medicine, depth hypnosis is involving the client in their own process so that they can learn how to make these kinds of adjustments in their, the way that they're running energy so that they're not dependent on an external healer to I mean, that's, it's one thing to be taught how to do it, but then, to, you know, it's like you want to teach someone how to fish rather than just keep giving them a fish, right? So it's a long answer to your question, but <laughs> did, I, did I answer it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. okay. All right. Any other questions, thoughts here? Is, is there a difference between the green Tara and the white Tara? Uh, yes and no. Good Buddhist answer. <laughs> um, <laughs> one, one is green and one is white. The green one, the green energy, is associated with the Moga Siddhi Buddha, the family of a Moga Siddhi, or someone called a Moga Siddhi, and it's the transmutation of the poison of jealousy into what's called miracle working uh, wisdom. And uh, the green Tara 
iconographically is shown sitting with, with uh, one leg crossed under her and one leg down, meaning that she's ready to come immediately to help you in, a, in any kind of crisis or situation like that. White Tara has her legs crossed. She has, um, she has eyes in the palms of her hand and in the soles of her feet. She has a cell of seven and three in her face. And um, she's calm and healing and she's a white color which is a transmutation of ignorance into what's called the mirroring wisdom. So mirror-like wisdom. So she's there for peaceful activities, uh, peaceful things, whereas the miracle-working one is sort of, um, you know, interventionist, let's say, you know. So then they have this uh, their famous sculpture that you find still in the hundreds or even maybe thousands in, in India mostly in museums now, because the Muslims broke them, mostly. But <clears throat> with the Tara, and then there's eight scenes around her. And the scenes are like people being attacked by elephants, lions, tigers, snakes, floods, forest fires, bad rulers, kings, and thieves, the bandits, so eight different things. And uh, the idea is the tiger is about to eat you, and you go, Om Tari Tu Tari Tu she comes and the tiger goes away. And it was very much uh, resorted to, there's an external thing. And then each one of those internally is some sort of inner mental disruption. And then Tara, Green Tara will come and help you about, like a balancing thing with that. With that. And there are these limitless numbers of Taras, of course. Like just a rainfall of Taras will come. But uh, when you summon, when you summon, or when you invite, or when you are helped by the green one, then then it's because you need something more powerful. When you are helped by the white one, it means you're going looking for a place of peace and so forth. Then there's a red one, who's a dominatrix, <laughs> who's dancing and she has a flower bow, and if you want to dominate some situation and control it in a positive way, and then there's a yellow one which is prospering. But then, but there are 21, there's 21 major forms of Tara that are recited in a famous prayer that every Tibetan knows by heart. <coughs> and which, which originally was a Sanskrit poem, so many people in India must have used that. So there each one has it, but the colors, white, yellow, red, and green, and green sometimes, dark green, or dark blue, even verging toward black, she's the really powerful one who really helps you in difficult circumstances. That's the green Tara. And she's really... She's great. Green Tara is totally great. There's also a black Tara who is very ferocious. She actually almost like Kali, actually. And uh, she, she um, destroys things that are unnecessary, that are destructive. You know? Okay. Actually, I thought at some stage we will do questioning and then we would ch I would teach you and we would chant together the Tara Mantra. Together, maybe. Is that good? Anything else? I know we spoke at dinner. You have a lot of questions, you said. Um, you mentioned the four kinds of Buddhas, and I've heard of a pra Pratekya Buddha. I'm sorry, the what? The Pratekya Buddha. Protector Buddha? Yeah, what is No, no, P-R-A-T-Y-E-K-A. -E well, in the, you see, the Tantra, there, there's considered to be, usually in Buddhism, there's the three poisons, which are the central source of all suffering. Uh, the most important of which is ignorance or delusion. And um, then there's uh, you know, greed, lust, that family of, of emotions. And then uh, there's hatred and anger and so on. And then you add to that pride and jealousy and you get five major poisons. Uh, pride is sort of ignorance uh, inflamed and inflated by narcissism. And jealousy is a combination of anger and lust, you know. So there are five of them. And uh, those relate to five colors, you know, uh, dark blue, like midnight, like dark blue, white, uh, yellow, red, and green. And um, in Tantra, these are transmuted into five wisdoms, these energies, where the, the, the dark blue, the, the central one actually is hatred, actually, or anger. Because anger is connected to intelligence and analysis, taking things apart, you know, to see what, they, what they're made of, how they work, to understand them. And that one transmutes into what's called ultimate reality perfection wisdom, because it sort of takes the world of suffering 
it turns that forceful anger onto the suffering of the world, takes it apart, and discovers that underneath, or actually in the core of it all, it is all actually all right, and there's nothing, nothing good can be destroyed, it's all good. And then, <coughs> then the white is, uh, is a delusion, and the delusion has to do with sort of materializing and thinking things are really not just what they are, but really what they are, like intrinsically, really independently, you know, what they are. And uh, so you see, if, like you see the floor as if it was a sort of thing in itself. But then the, that, that it mirrors the fact that you see it, however, even though you see it wrongly as if it were absolute when it's actually relative, that mirrors the fact that it is only relative in its emptiness, and you're seeing its emptiness. So that's the mirror, that's the fact that the seemingly, the distorted perception of relative things reveals their actual relativity because you're perceiving. Once you connect to it, then it's relative. Even though you see it as if it were an absolute thing over there, but it's intrinsic objectivity. Their, their understanding of this, this uh, sort of intrinsic identity habit is so sophisticated in the, in the ancient Indian psychology, it's really wonderful. Having to do with how language works and how perception works and so on. So that's the mirror wisdom, which is transforms the delusion or an ignorance into the mirror wisdom. Then, then in the yellow direction you have pride, and, uh, and pride connects to miserliness, actually. So narcissism, which is, it can be either pride or miserliness, you know, greedy, holding something, hoarding it yourself, proudly, because you're so great. And that transmutes into what's called the wisdom of equality. And that's a golden yellow, like yellow sapphire or yellow diamond. It's a golden uh, energy, you know. And uh, then the, 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 the red one is lust, uh, of course, passion, lust which translates, transmutes into what's called individuating wisdom, which sort of brings up the beauty, you know, beauty in front of me, beauty behind me, beauty all around. It sees the individual thing as a manifestation of the all-good nature of the, of the clear light of the void, but it sees that that's like the red color, where passion becomes, you know, creativity, individuating creativity is, the, is maybe the way Lama Vinda translated individuating wisdom, which I think is really very good, better than any scholar did. And then, any sort of academic. Finally, in the north, you have, and these are in most mandalas of unexcelled yoga, what it's called, you have the green. And the green is, as I said, jealousy transmuted into all accomplishing wisdom, wonder working, miracle working wisdom. And that's kind of fun because, like, jealousy is what makes people unable to get things done because they don't work together, because they compete with each other instead of cooperating. And uh, it's the source of, you know, wars and all kinds of terrible things, but when it's overcome and transmuted, then people can cooperate and then they ma multiply their, their efforts and they can accomplish anything and what was previously thought to be a miracle can be accomplished. So those are, those five elemental things then connect to five Buddha families, as they call them, and, um, and then Tara belongs, use, most Tara belongs, Tara, Tara is in all of them, but there are Tara forms in all of the families, but in a way she's very connected to the Lotus family, which is the, the red one, the passion one, the individuating wisdom. But on the other hand, she functions everywhere. All of these things are just creativity, really. You know, they're like, uh, they're sort of ways of, they're archetypes for relating to sort of the primal energies of the unconscious. The key thing about Buddhist <coughs> psychology is that it does not believe that the unconscious has to remain unconscious. And in fact, it feels that the purpose of a person who decides they want to really use their human life to the maximum evolutionary advantage, to the most positive way they can use it, the, the wonderful human intelligence, which they especially do because everyone is a self-made human in a certain way, in the sense that everyone's been every other kind of animal and even a god and even a demon and everything, but having won the human form, it's this ideal form in which to evolve towards Buddhahood, not just towards divinity or heaven, but towards Buddhahood, towards full enlightenment. And uh, and so uh, so so these these, these so, so therefore that's right. So therefore, you don't want to die with your unconscious still unconscious, because it's like a dream. You don't know which nightmare it's going to produce. You know whether you're going to be driven by greed, you're going to be driven by jealousy, you're going to be driven by fear and, and hatred, you're going to, this kind of thing. So you want to be fully conscious of everything within your human life so you can consciously choose how you will be reborn and so forth. And, uh, 
they make a big fuss that like an enlightened person no longer is reborn because that's what they said in dualistic Buddhism. But what that means in, in non-dual Mahayana Buddhism, universal vehicle Buddhism is that you no one needs to be reborn driven by unconscious ignorance-based instinct. That, but but once, you're, once you realize the all-good nature of reality, your love for beings, your wish, which is nothing but your automatic wish to share the bliss that you have discovered, it flows out of you, and, you, and then you want to be reborn in some way, but you can control where. You know, and that's the whole idea of like a, something like a Dalai Lama or something was pretty much uniquely cultivated to the highest degree in Tibet and Mongolia. In India they had it, of course, but it wasn't institutionalized in the same way. Where they go and find a child, you know, or the child, you know, gets up and says, "Okay, mom and daddy, actually, you know, I'm supposed to go down to that monastery and study because I am the Lama so and so, and my disciples are behaving badly, and I have to go and straighten them out." Type of thing, you know. And this started around 13th century, and was really great. I I used to be against it. In I thought it was too much, you know, that the secular, the, the, these kind of lamas being like practically. You know, if you, if you were going to run for president in Tibet, you'd not just stand on your record, you have to stand on what you did in your previous lives also. <laughs> you know, so they would be competing in that way. You know? and, uh, but then I realized this was the way in which Tibet undid its militaristic conquest empire nature before Buddhism went there. Because the great adepts went there and they sort of they spread this, uh, this, this choice, this life choice, of real bliss, real pleasure, you know, in in this very individualistic society, Tibetan, because they were nomadic. You know, nomads tend to be more individualistic than people who live in hierarchical cities and things. And uh, and so it's really quite a wonderful system. So that, that's a, those are the systems of the five Buddhas, and there's many different ways of arranging. People want to know, oh, is the way is the north always green, or is this and that? There's just an infinite number of different systems. One of the greatest masters from Bengal who went to Tibet, Atisha, and he went there because he had Green Tara always talked to him. He actually had a statue that would talk to him and tell him what to do. He would ask the statue and it would talk. But it was her, actually. She would just animate the statue when he asked her a question. And uh, she sent him to Indonesia, for example, to recover certain teachings of love and compassion for when he was there 17 years. That they'd been lost a little bit in India, which had become a little bit decadent. And then he was invited to Tibet. And she said, well, if you go there, your life will be shortened by about 20 years, but you'll make 12, 15, 18 more years there. But what you do there will have a much bigger impact than just staying here for a longer period in India, so go ahead. And uh, uh, I forgot how I lost in I had a reason. But, oh, yeah, yeah. But he was, a, he was a prince of a royal family in Bengal, and he was already a big Buddhist scholar, and he was very into it. And then one night he had a dream, and a whole bunch of Dakinis, which are these female deity spirits, I think, they came to him in a dream, and they said, oh, we hear you are like a great scholar, and, and that you really like Tantra, we heard. And uh, would you like to see a few Tantras? We have maybe a few experts you haven't seen that you might like. And would you like to see them? Oh, yeah, I'd really like to see them. But he thought he was a big master, you know. So then they showed up with a giant steamer trunk, but this was in a dream. And when he opened the steamer <coughs> trunk, he didn't recognize a single title of the huge bunch of tantras that were there. That he, so, you know, he, he was humbled by how much knowledge he didn't have. And so then they said to him, oh, you'd like to learn a few more of these, maybe? And they said, well, then why don't you get serious and quit being a prince and go be a monk and get into serious study? Which he did. Which is contrary to how people think. They think tantricas are always out, you know, uh, like running around in the in the jungle. But actually, he he went into the tantric deities made him go into the university because it's so it's so sophisticated and technical. There's so much to study about it. And uh, like I think in the future, you know, shamanism, you know, since it was non-literate oral thing pretty much, and in small communities of uh, of indigenous people, tribes and things. But now, when it's being collected kind of by, by yourself and by modern people who sort of can do comparative shamanism, I think it's going to be like stacked, in, a lot of it will be stacked up and organized and, you know, the standoffs and the East Equitardies and other kind of people like that. And in a file we'll see that. But India, that they did that a long time ago. You know, India is really the big mother 
like Dalai Lama himself goes around nowadays and he says, I'm not really from some Tibetan Buddhist sect or something. I'm a son of Nalanda University, which was the great, great thousand year, 1200 year university in central India, you know, that was burned down in the 13th century, 12th century by one guy for Tajikistan, you know, a silly guy, you know. And after he took the golden statues out, he burned them. Library. Said that it was said that the nine-story library of that of that monastery burned for three months. It said, it was like Library of Alexandria sort of thing. You know? So is that answer that? I mean, there's a lot of more about it. But one thing, just so there are many different versions depending on many different people's needs, and it's not like there's just one thing, and that's what tantra is. The point. All methods of making the world beautiful for others is what it's about. That's what mandala means, you know. Uh, mandala. mandala means a protecting circle for the mind, actually. Mandala means essential place or circle. So mandala is, and like I had one teacher, Dalai Lama, senior teacher, was one of my teachers. Uh, he's a great man, passed away like long ago, but he always said, if anybody tells you that such and such a mandala, this or that, is in some place, they don't know what they're talking about, meaning that every atom has any mandala, you know, if you know how to like visualize it and create it and, and uh, occupy it you know, and, and meet the people, who, the, the entities that do occupy it, so really neat. Protect, oh, you mentioned about protector. Actually, what they call protectors are usually some kind of like lower angels. You know, the, 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 those Buddhas are not into protecting in the sense of problems or obstructions, things like that. The Buddhas are into helping you do soul retrieval, soul development, evolve toward Buddhahood, this kind of thing. But they're kind of archangelic things because the Buddhas never destroy demons. They make them, they put them to work, you know, they harness them. They, they, uh, they take their power, they get them to use their forceful and destructive power in positive ways. And the sort of the typical Buddhist myth, myth about like a demon is not destroying the demon. It's taking the demon, chaining them down, and lecturing them interminably for like a few centuries, some of them. <laughs> until, they get, until they get it, you know, getting them to study. In other words, and then use their tremendous energies to protect beings, etc. The most wonderful version of that is the god of death, the Indian god of death, Yama who has the head of a Mahe, and then there's a version of the Bodhisattva of Wisdom. He emanates himself as what's called Yamantaka, which means the terminator of death, or the, I like to say the terminator exterminator, since the death is the terminator, though, then the exterminator exterminates the terminator. When death dies, nobody dies, because death is not there to kill anybody anymore. He's, and he has this kind of, he becomes a very important protector in the God of death. So the death of death as a symbol of immortality is a marvelous thing. Very ferocious. When I was younger, I was scared of the market. But I kind of like it now. <laughs> do you want to do some uh, Sorry? Do you want to do some mantras? Oh yeah, let's do a mantra. Okay. Now, you know how when you learn a Vipassana or something, or which is this very beginning mindfulness actually, where you do thing of you count your breath from one to ten? Right? And then you bring your mind back when it wanders from the count, and then you go back to counting, maybe right? Remember that, right? But some of you have done it, I'm sure, a lot of you. So mantra practice is a similar thing. When we learn it, we'll chant it like as if it was chanting aloud. But once you learn it, it becomes a great thing to meditate where you murmur it. The Sanskrit word is japa. And you, you murmur, you don't say it loud so that your mind doesn't scatter with a loud voice. You murmur it, and then it becomes, instead of <coughs> counting the breath, and you don't have to, you can, they have rosaries that you can count it on. You don't have to count it, but you just keep saying it, and you don't even think after a while what it means, you just keep saying it. And, uh, and when you do, you, uh, that becomes like the thread that you keep your concentration on, and then you can use that just like counting your breath to develop your concentration. And it has the added benefit that... Uh, that the particular mantra, different particular mantras, evoke the presence of particular archetype deities, as I call them. And the one we'll do, because we, 
Uh, it's a broad tower, obviously, and we, we, but we changed it, the form of it, but it's still a white tower. So we'll do Tara's mantra, okay? So uh, some of you may know it, but we'll start by you repeating back and forth. Uh, me, right? Bob, do you want to record? Well, do you want to record? No, that's okay. No, I, I don't really, I don't really Okay, okay. So then I'll say three or four syllables, then repeat that. And then after a while, we'll try to get through the whole thing. We will start to learn it. Then just keep saying, we'll keep saying it together, okay? So, Om Tare. Om Tare. Tutare. Tutare. Ture. Ture. Swaha. Swaha. Om Tare. Om Tare. Tutare. Ture. Ture. Swaha. Swaha. Om Tare. Om Tare. Tutare. Tutare. Ture. Swaha, Om Tare Tutare, Ture 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 Swaha, Om Tare Tutare Ture, 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 Swaha, Om Tare Tutare Ture Swaha Om Tare Tutare Ture Swaha Okay, now all together. Om Tare Om Tare Tutare Ture Swaha 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 Om Tare Tutare 
it comes out from out of her mouth, from around her heart. It's going around her heart clockwise, her heart chakra. It comes, keep saying, keep saying, keep saying. Keep saying. And, it, and it comes out of her mouth and goes into your mouth. And then it goes down and goes around your heart clockwise. And then it comes out as you say it, so there's a string of mantras between her heart and your heart. And she's shining there in front of you, either white tower, green tower, whatever you want. Whatever you want to visualize her. So it's just a blob of white or blob of green. But the letters are coming from you and around your heart and coming out of your mouth. Her heart is of all Buddhas, also infinitely you know, immersed in the clear light with us, and M mm is the mind of all Buddhas. And so Om, when you say Om, you're emphasizing, you're sort of evoking that you are totally infused with the you know, subatomic energy presence of all Buddhas, the light, the, the light, the light which is your subtle, real body, deepest body, soul body's energy is completely suffused with the energy of all Buddha. Tara 
is uh, her name, it means savioress, and Tare means Otara, it's a vocative. So Otara, and then Tutare means, uh, you know, save me, you know, deliver me, free me. And Ture means quickly. <coughs> and so Tare, Tutare. So Om, Om Savior is quickly deliver me. Uh, Svaha means all good or all hail. Suaha, you know, say bliss, literally. Say bliss. Swa, suka aha, sukam aha. Say bliss. But that means like welcome or hail, you know. And, um, you know, when you, it's, it's very powerful to cultivate your one pointed mind by murmuring such a mantra, and especially the Tara is so wonderful. In the sense that when you just count your breath, you're sort of focusing on your body, because breath is sort of the bridge between mind and body, and your speech energy is sort of floats free in your other extra thoughts about <coughs> counting your breath. This a little bit, in, it's a little bit tied up in the one, two, three, four, five, but then it distracts and you think something, you know, some inner monologue departs from there, and then you you notice that you dismount. <coughs> You bring it back, and it's very, very good, very, very basic. But when you do a mantra, and that becomes the string which you are keeping your mind focused on, then your mind will veer away by thinking, why am I saying it? I already said it enough time. Now I know what this is. Why am I keep doing this? You know, like, what's the point? You know, where's Tara? So, you know, mind or then just thinking about dinner or tomorrow or yesterday or whatever it is. And then you bring your mind back to saying and Tutari. So you have your speech energy focused in the mantra as well as your mental focus. And of course you are breathing to say it. And, uh, and a, a good thing about it is it kind of, when you say a mantra like that, murmur a mantra, it slows your breathing down, which is good in the sense that you can more concentrate. And you actually learn to in say it, keep saying it as you inhale, like you go Om Tari Tutari 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 Swaha Om Tari. So you can breathe in and out without breaking the flow of the mantra. And uh, then you add, then when one becomes more adept at that, one adds all kinds of visualizations and all sorts of things. And uh, it's really quite, quite wonderful. And uh, one thing that helps recite it just the, the tea that is used in English, the only tea we have is what's called an aspirated tea. You know, there's a kind of a breath that departs from the tea, you know, like, ah, like, ah, like that. Whereas this particular letter is what's called the unaspirated tea. It's, it's called ta. So if you say it properly, ta, there'll be hardly any breath will come out of your mouth when you say it. The tari, tu tari, and so you do, you, you puff less, you know, you pant less when you recite the tari, tu tari, tu tari, so on. So everyone knows that now by heart, right? Mm -hmm. As they say, we said it about, I think, I forgot, I lost count, four or five hundred, either four or five hundred, oh, yeah. and eight multiplied by eight, so either yeah. four hundred and thirty-two or five hundred and forty, but I forgot that it was four or five and that's <laughs> So, so uh, that's a very good start, tu tari, tu tari. Irish people must think it's really great because Tara is a big Irish name, right? Gaelic <laughs> Tara. Right? Tara was not the name of the heroine in, in uh, Gone with the Wind, right? It was the name of the land. Okay, the house. But it house. is a very common uh, a Gaelic yeah, name. Common. As well as Sanskrit name. It connects to uh, the Sanskrit word for star also. Tara. But it basically means is to deliver or to save someone from drowning, to deliver them across the water. Bob, Tara was the uh, hill. I'm in sorry? Ar Tara was the hill in Ireland where the high kings lived, the oh. hill of Tara. What was that? It, uh, Tara was the hill where the high king lived in, in oh. Ireland. In Ireland, oh, right. yeah, oh. the hill of Tara. Oh, yes, right. Oh, sometimes it was the high queen I, I heard. I, don't think there, I think there was only one high queen. Well, I know, but I'm just saying Sex, that the balance of sexes I know in Irish history the queens the were very, very powerful. And that great book by Kay Hill called How the Irish Saved mm -hmm. Civilization. That's wonderful. The, the abbesses of the Christian monasteries were much more powerful in Ireland than anywhere else in those days. And then, so therefore they made the stupid guys say things, you know, copy them. 
put them to work. <laughs> okay. so, so there's one thing I wanted to say about the practice that we did just now related yes, to yes, what please, we talked please, about please, this morning. Please. Yeah. So this morning we were talking about ritual and the power of ritual, and we were talking about the way in which sound and light and movement and dance and you know sound and song are um, they are pathways and when you in, when you involve song or dance or movement into a ritual what you are doing is you are creating a kind of highway for unseen power to come into the world of the scene right so we talked about how how rituals will do that and how sound when used in rituals will do that and so here's a really good example we're working with the mantra of Tara and as Bob said the, then, then the, the sound becomes the highway through which and, and if you have you know a regular practice if the, the ritual that you engage in through the practice and the sound that you say becomes the pathway that Tara can enter into your experience and offer you help. So this idea of asking for say, you know, being saved is not really theoretical when you break it down into understanding the, the power of sound and its use in ritual that we were exploring today. So I just kind of wanted to make that connection for you. I'm very, very proud of you all reciting it. So a couple of people not moving their lips. <laughs> lazy. Because when, when one of my first teachers used to say, when you try to learn something, the verbal like that, you have to go past where your mind tells her to tell you, well, now I know this. And you have to let your tongue learn it. If I continue to just ignore the thought that now I know it, I don't need to do this anymore. And do more with your tongue. It's a very good way, it's very helpful to learn a language that way. You know. And let your tongue learn it. <laughs> so does anyone else have any questions about any of the material that we've covered? Yeah. I had a question about the tarot. What was, do you know the name of the, you said there was a famous poem of all 21 tarots? There's a famous um, poem. Tarot, it's the echo or something. There's a, there's a Sanskrit, the, the, the Sanskrit poem that you referred to that um, is the, that talks about the 21 taras. Oh, do you yeah. know the name of it? Yeah, well, uh, I don't, uh, I'm not remembering it. It's, it's so famous in Tibetan. The Tibetan translation is so nice and wonderful. Uh, I can't quite remember the, the Sanskrit uh, version, I think, because I always recited the Tibetan one, and now I've forgotten it. But... Um, I think I probably have a version of it in my computer. I'll, I'll try to bring it tomorrow. But uh, the Sanskrit one is in the Tara Sutra. The problem is that a lot of the Sanskrit books were destroyed, you know, in the great burning that took place uh, by the invaders of India a thousand years ago. And um, so uh, the Tibetan translations are what we have often. And then sometimes they find the text, and I think there was a one found. Tara Sutra from the Tara Sutra. And I think it's the same as the 21 Tara. Well, let me look into it and I'll, I'll bring something for you tomorrow. But it's wonderful. There's a, you know, there's the, the, the golden blazing Tara who stamps her foot and all demons disappear. And then there's the red dominatrix Tara who, who attracts all the kings and makes them stop fighting and be peaceful. And then there's the, etc. You know, they're, and they're, each one has a verse of praise, 21 verses. And uh, then they say, if you recite this every day, Three times, then everything will be totally cool. You know, it's, like, it's, like, it's like the Buddhist Hail Mary sort of thing, but it's a little more elaborate. And every Tibetan person knows that, and they all recite all of them. And then, Chatsa Dharma Nyoma Pamo. Chatsa means homage. Dharma means the savior, as you know, Tara in Tibetan. Nyoma means swift one. Pamo means heroine. Chatsa Dharma Nyoma Pamo. Jaini Kechig Lo Dandama who were born in a lightning flash from the eye of the great compassionate one, that's Avalokiteshvara. That refers to a legend where Avalokiteshvara, the Bodhisattva, who's, up, who's uh, the one on the upper right above her with the white, I mean, there are many forms of him, but that's a famous one. 
on the right, that one, yes, hold with four arms, right one. And he went, he was meditating for many lifetimes, I know a long life because he's like a celestial, on human beings becoming more peaceful and less violent and less greedy and less deceitful and all this. And, um, and he was noticing with his clairvoyant bar that they were not improving. He was radiating love and all this and compassion. And so he, but he had made a vow that if he became discouraged, he wanted, he wanted to be torn to pieces, his body. So he's getting almost discouraged and then he cries. He's, he, 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 he weeps. And then two tears, the first two tears that fall from his two eyes, they turn into white and green Tara. And they say to him, don't cry, you know, of course you can't fix all these, these, sentient, these silly sentient mm -hmm. beings. You're just a man, you know, what do you expect? We're going to help take care of it. We can make miracles. Just, you know, keep meditating. <laughs> we'll work on it. And uh, so that's sort of the, one of the origin legends of Tara. You know? But then, that, then still he gets discouraged later, and then he's split in a thousand pieces, and then his head is split in ten pieces, and then the, his guru, the who is in her crown of her head. If you look here, you'll see she has a little Buddha on her headdress, which is proper way of doing white tower, who's red in color. That's the Buddha Amitabha, boundless light, mm -hmm. from the lotus family, the individuating wisdom. And he comes down, and have a look at this, where it's like a thousand pieces scattered across the mountainside. Head is shattered in ten. Oh. And he said, that Buddha says, like, you should always be careful what you wish for, because sooner or later it will happen. Mm -hmm. And then blessed him into this thousand arm, thousand eyed, you know, thing. If you must have seen that, double look at the It's a nice, it's a nice, it's very shamanic myth in the sense that he's torn to bits, unable to sort of deal with the world suffering, you know. But then the, then the enlightened wisdom, the creative wisdom, puts him back together in a much more powerful form and with a slightly fierce top head. His tenth head is a little bit fierce looking. You know, he was being too, a little bit of tough love there, fierce compassion. They're wonderful, those legends. They're really nice. They come from India. Even the name Avalokita Ishvara, the word Ishvara means God, Avalokita means looking after, caring God. So it's kind of a, it's a, it's a challenge to the Vedic idea of the gods who are fearsome, you know, <clears throat> that there's a caring one. You know? And it relates to the maturing of Indian civilization after Buddha's time. Um, could you guys speak to Tibet's indigenous shamanistic tradition, the Bon tradition, and its place within the framework we're working with? I'm asking about Bon, if you guys can speak on the Bon tradition. Can, can you speak to the Bon tradition in the Himalayas, the shamanic tradition in the Himalayas of Bon? Well, Bon. And its context yes, here, Bern, and what Bern, we're talking about. Some people think that Bon was shamanism, but that's not true. There was a, there was a kind of. Uh, tribal shamanism in Tibet when Buddhism came there. But before Buddhism came there, a royal cult came with roots in Iran, in the Persian Empire, which was the great empire of the ancient time. And the Tibetan Empire is about 2,300 years recorded old, and even before that probably was longer, but they, they have a, this is the Tibetan year 2158 or something, I forgot exactly. But it's very, very old. And um, in that time, you know, the, Iran was a very, very powerful empire. We're stretching from Greece to India and Afghanistan and so on, up into Central Asia. And so there was a royal cult, which was the precursor of Ben, uh, that itself had sort of transmuted shamanistic rites, but like other kind of pharaonic type of rites, they had rather awful things of like enduring wives and servants with kings, you know, in their tombs and animal sacrifice and all kinds of things like that. But yet it was a high sort of royal cult, temp you know, temple cult. It was not a tribal cult already, you know. And then when Buddhism came in, brought in by a particular emperor at a, at a certain point, he brought it in. So it was a top-down importation. And uh, it displaced that uh, cult. And, you know, again, in the, the great Buddhist adepts, they stopped the sacrifices, you know. So then the burn were kind of upset, you know. There was a, there was conflict, and um, and then a few generations later, like after about 150 years of that first importation, uh, the, there was kind of a, a, a reaction where one particular branch of the royal family 
the burn, some burn priest got in charge of him, and he said, well, this Buddhist thing is making you too peaceful, it's ruining the empire, the Chinese are going to bug you, some Mongolians, some Turks, you know, the Nepalis, the Bengalis, all the people that had been conquered are starting to push for independence, because you're getting all peaceful, all money, pay me home, we're Buddhists and all this. So burn, you need your burn cult again, we'll make you powerful again. And that particular guy did, and he suppressed Buddhism for about a hundred years. But already by that time, that was like six or seven or eight generations into Buddhism being there, Buddhism had become popular on the popular level. And people were feeling better about not doing animal sacrifice, and actually people were feeling better not having war all the time, being a complex dynasty. So in a way they were choosing to be more happy and to be less powerful in the sense of conquering people. And so then Byrne decided to get into the Buddhist business and they created a whole set of scriptures and practices that are exact same as Buddhist. But they said these came from Iran and it was an older Buddha. And so, you know, we had all the same, like Prasnaparamita, everything, and monkhood and Bodhisattvahood and Buddhahood, every term and word, exactly the same huge pile of books they somehow created. And uh, so I like to say uh, that the Tibetans became so Buddhist because the great adepts went there and transformed the society that even the non-Buddhists were Buddhist. <laughs> and nowadays, nowadays, Bern in the exile, not in Tibet still, but in exile, uh, Bern is considered like the fifth school of Buddhism. And Tenzin Wangyal and people around here who teach Bern are really teaching Buddhism, basically. Totally, and because, but that's called, by the Buddhists, that's called White Bern. Black Bern is a group that is sort of not officially with that White Bern, but they still do some kind of animal sacrifice, and they're very kind of marginal. And, and the, even the White Bern people don't like them, you know, because they're killing, they do kill animals. Milarepa had a big contest with the, with the famous Bernbo shaman, and it was, there was some kind of competition there. But again, they never, the Buddhists never destroy any other people. They just sort of vegetarianize them and set them aside. <laughs> and uh, they, didn't, they, they couldn't be vegetarian in Tibet because that was not the economy but in those days. But you know, they stopped them from holy immediately. You know, only, that's all. So, Bern, so Bern is marvelous, and Bern kind of has a kind of link to kind of ancient shamanic and tribal level but it's a second mediated link. In other words, if Buddhism is the third wave that came, the second wave was the burn, and the first <coughs> wave was the tribal shamanism. So some people conflate burn and think burn was shamanistic. And, and actually, the other Buddhists in the world, are only since the Dalai Lama came out, have the few of them come to start to appreciate that Tibetan Buddhism preserves the whole of Indian Buddhism and has monastic, solid monasticism, and the solid uh, uh, Mahayanism, and then it has the Tantra as well. Until recent, until the 60s, when His Holiness started manifesting that in the Tibetan monasteries, we rebuilt in India and all this uh, to some extent. Before that, they all thought that Tibetan Buddhism was corrupted by Jamanism, actually, the other Buddhists. Even though in Thailand and Burma and these places, they do have local spirit worship cults. And they once did have Tantra, actually. Sri Lanka had plenty of Tantra and Mahayana. But in the ninth century there was some political thing and some monastery that was intolerant about Mahayana and Tantra life. But it really had to do with the politics of two, two sons of some king in some dynasty. And one of them won and then they wiped out the, the Mahayana Buddhists and the Tantrikas. So that's, that's sort of the recent sort of super orthodox weird Theravadins uh, is only recent ancient time. The, most of the Theravadins were also Mahayanas, and also some of them practiced Tantra. And uh, in fact, I would say before 19, the Chinese invasion in 1950, the largest population of Theravada vow-holding monks were the Tibetans. And there were more Theravada monks in, Tibetan, mm -hmm. in Tibet than in all of the three sort of major orthodox Theravada countries, modern Theravada countries combined. Burma had, was, was a little, the one with the far more than Sri Lanka or Thailand. But, because um, uh, there were so many, you know, Mount Tibetan was so super monasticized, you know. It was like 20, you know, 20 percent of the people from monks or nuns, you know. Which was very good for a population balance. It's a good population control thing. People choosing not to have children voluntarily. So it's quite a, quite a good mechanism. You know, the communists in Asia, 
and China, for example, went around shouting about how monasteries are parasites and all this. And you know, when Mao said, when China has stood up, you know, in 1949, you know, when he took over, there were 600, 600 million Chinese. And then they'd had one child policy and all these terrible things for a while, you know. And now there's 1.2 billion. I think they were evading the policy. They doubled their population. Whereas if they had even 2 million monks and nuns, and in Taiwan there's tons of nuns. Oh, the nuns are, the Chinese nuns are super duper. They like, you know, like lawyers and scientists and they're fantastic. They don't want to be bugged around by the Chinese men. And they run around, you can walk around a corner in Taipei and get trampled by a herd of them. They go, a gaggle of nuns, they go shooting by. They're so intelligent. I, I had several PhD students who were Taiwanese nuns. So bright and brilliant. And they, believe me, they are not waiting to be taken out by Donald Trump on Saturday night. <laughs> we have lost males. You know, we're, like, we're educated, we're enlightened, we're like, have our inner streaming, we don't need all that. They're really great. You know. We have the wrong idea about monasticism in the West because we associate it with, uh, you know, you know, terrible, you know, name of the crows and people boiling each other in oil and and then people being repressed. We think, you know, but not exactly, not really actually. It's just there when you don't have the ordinary householder outlets of that energy and you don't simply suppress it. And you have some sort of meditative technology then then you can feel that inner, like Citrace of Avila, Hildegard of Bingy Lubicum. They were like streaming with, with vital energy. You know? Precisely because they gave up the normal huffing and puffing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, any last question? Yeah. Could you speak, both of you, to the different um, realms within the dream states? You first. Uh, what was it? It was about the dream states? About the dream yeah. states. Uh, it's, are, you, are you speaking about like the bardo? Um, well, if I could answer that question, uh, I'd like to answer that question in a particular way that incorporates both shamanic practice and Buddhist practice, sure, if that's sure. okay. Well, yeah, sure. So in, um, and I know that my description of the six lokas is a little, I learned it slightly differently than you did, so I'm sorry if it's a little bit well, off. Well, you'll bump into me if you... <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know, I was I, 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 haven't, I haven't incorporated what you but said. But that's okay. Uh, you have to right, tell me yeah. again. All right. So, um, so... Um, you remember this afternoon we were talking about the inner cosmography of the shamanic uh, worldview, and we talked about the upper world, the middle world, and the lower world. So the middle world is, as we said, the place where you find compassionate spirits, but you also find uncompassionate spirits, right? And the uncompassionate spirits that you find in shamanic practice are described as um, you know, uh, beings that are trying to take something from you or, you know, install themselves in your psychic field and take something from you from that vantage point. Or, you know, they're kind of up to, they, they, the, the essential understanding about middle world spirits who are not compassionate in nature is that they have lost connection with their own sources of life energy and therefore they are trying to tap into other sources of life energy that people have that they don't have. And you find people in bodies doing the same thing. You know, most codependent relationships are that, right? Where you have one person who's got an aspect of themselves that they won't inhabit, so the other person comes in and inhabits it, and then there, you know, and the, there's an exchange where the other person's not inhabiting part of their being, and the other person comes in and inhabits it, and now they have a relationship, and now they can't leave because they'll both be hurt if, and then, People stay in relationships like that way too long, right? Yeah. So, um, so those are the kinds of relationships that middle world spirits also form with people, right? Mm -hmm. So in Buddhism, there's this concept of the six lokas, mm -hmm. and the six lokas in uh, in some forms of Buddhist thought are considered to be actual realms or lands that are characterized by particular beings who are put, uh, characterized by particular <laughs> kinds of emotion. And in other levels of Buddhist practice, 
the six lokas are conceived of as um, states of mind. And that. Can I, but I must say, okay. only modern materialists try to do that. Right. Uh, it's not in any form of Buddhism, actually. Absolutely not. Really? No. It's just made up by Trungpa and people like that who are catering to really? Western material. Really? Absolutely. Oh. Without forming future life, there's no path practice of Dharma as far as Buddhism goes okay. in all countries. Okay. Except until now. Okay. Now there are people saying, well, we want to be Buddhists without former future life. Which oh, is no, fine. I'm, but I'm not saying that there's no former or future life. I'm just saying that the lokas are considered to be a state of mind in some Levels of well, practice, yeah, the, the different locus, the different you, you, the, actually, loka is actually not quite the right word. The different migrations, they call it, or jagat, the Sanskrit word, you know, where people go, they migrate through death into those places, the heavens, the, the titans, animals, the hungry ghosts, and they're not ghosts, actually, hungry beings, mm -hmm. and the hell, and the, and the human is the other one. And, uh, they, one goes in there compared to being a human by intensifying particular negative poisons. Right. So they are particular negative states of mind, actually, all five of them. Right, right, right. And there were five non-human ones. And the humans luckily have all of the negative things. <laughs> so they balance each other, something like that. Okay. So out of six migrations rather than worlds, they're not really considered separate worlds. They're just options for rebirth. And uh, five of them are, you know, if you, a god is pride, you know, the intensification of pride, the titans are the intensification of jealousy, the animals are intensi intensification of stupidity and ignorance, the hungry beings, which are not ghosts, are the intensification of uh, greed, lust, and the hells of hatred. But that doesn't mean that when you're in hatred, you're in hell, or when you're hating something, you're in hell, or when you desire. So you can't really say they're states of mind, but they, they are incarnations that, that are driven by someone being predominantly focused on one or the other of the poisons, being completely driven by more, but everybody's driven by all of them, but more predominantly by those. Okay. Sorry. So, so Sorry. that's, so Sorry that, that's a really good description of the middle world, right? So, so these are the different states that you find in the middle world. I apologize for enjoying, but the only reason no, no, I did it's okay. is that, you know, remember Meister Eckhart? Yes. Our dear Meister Eckhart? I mean Eckhart Tolle, our modern yes. Oprah's Meister Eckhart. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, his big thing was, get out of everything and be in the now, right? Yeah. Well, I'm not Meister Eckhart, although I do know him, actually, and I quite challenged him on this, which <laughs> overpassed that, and he was quite appreciative. <laughs> and my thing is, multiple lives. It's a huge effort. It's a huge effort for any of us who grew up in this materialist world where the scientific authorities assure us that they've discovered that, that having a future life, having the soul continuum, subtle mind continuum after death is some primitive backward thing. And we are, we are people, we are we're Americans and we're living for this life, we're going for the gusto, we're going for the gold, and never mind what happens because we'll be nothing when we die. It's very hard, even though we may already have a spiritual or mystical idea, it's hard for us to really viscerally feel that, about that. Mm -hmm. But it says it's more powerful than, the, than Eckhart's thing even, of being in the moment, like just getting out of all expectations and all mm -hmm. fantasies and all memories, and, which is quite powerful, and just sort of really being here now, right? Ram and Dass, Ram and Dass, and it's like a big deal. And it's kind of a nice big deal, but... If you think that what the reality of now is that the, at its base there's nothing, because you have no soul or mind, then your now moment is kind of isolated from other things. Whereas if you're aware of yourself as this beginningless and endless continuity, what you get committed to is the quality of your continuity. It's like, you know, you're going to be going and taking that bus to New York, so you want to know that it, the driver knows the road, it's on the right place, and you're going to get out at the right stop. You know, you, you're concerned for somewhere where you know you're going to be continuing. And this changes the quality of your life dramatically. And so I'm sorry, but I just had to, I had oh, to emphasize, underline, dot, dot, dot. <laughs> and, and my slogan is, in relation to the business of the dead, nobody gets out of here a dead. <laughs> Which then changes the way you are here. Very, very.
right? Because there's consequences. Everything has unlimited consequences. Mm -hmm. So the smaller you become mindful, the smallest positive thing you mm -hmm. want to want to make it just a little more positive than not negative. Anyway, that's all. I just wanted to explain my route of interruption. But please I, go I ahead. I would always rather listen to please you. Go ahead, to please me. go ahead. Always. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think your question got answered, yeah? I don't think so. No, the dream. No, no, that's, help her with the dream. You know, the, we, we did the lower, we did the okay, so, dream state. So, so, do you want to state your question again then? You it was, about what about the dream state? Six dream states, or however many dream states, are we to experience them while we're awake or in the daytime? Are these dream states that we only enter when we're sleeping or when we're passing through death? Um, I'm trying to get so I think uh, you, you're asking. Work. She's asking about the bardos of dream and sleep and death. Yeah. So. Well, that's a practice. You know, you can think of sleeping as a as rehearsing dying, mm -hmm. and you can sleep of dreaming as rehearsing being in the between, mm -hmm. and waking up as rehearsing being born. Mm -hmm. And in a way, there is a practice like that. I mean, that's a very high practice actually. It's, it's called dream yoga. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so. But you know, the, but it's a, it's a, not a, it's like the shamanic thing. You don't want to go off contacting any old spirit without guidance. Mm -hmm. So you know, it's the the basic thing that you when you become unconscious in the sleep, you have hit the level of the dark light, having gone through the white light and the and the orange golden sunlight and the moonlit uh, white light, and then you hit the dark light, and then you conk out and you go to sleep. But project that you are in the clear light infinite positive energy unfolded. That's really where you are. You're not just completely out of it. So that makes you safe. And if it's hard to sort of make that feel visceral, you have like a relationship with the White Tara, with your shamanic teacher, with whoever it is, someone who you kind of trust, who you feel can navigate these things, and then you feel they're present with you, and that you may have a lesson to learn in the in-between state, in the dream state. And then you might have some kind of message from the dream. You know, and then they have all that lucid dreaming stuff where you do journaling and you do, you know, you do all that. But you don't have to get into how this is going to be a bardo and everything. Mm -hmm. Because, but if you, and, and you do prepare well for the bardo if you learn to lucidly dream, that is to know you're dreaming without waking out of the dream. And then kind of be more mindful in the dream of what you're learning and then carry over the memory more into what you're, how, how you're awakened. And if you're in a shamanic path with a shamanic teacher, they'll introduce you maybe to elements of nature, but that's for her to talk about. I believe that. In the Buddhist one, you have, um, you're in a mandala maybe, or it depends on what you're practicing and visualizing. Even you visualize your own body in the dream state as a Tara, you might, for example, at a certain advanced level, or at least you feel the presence of a Tara at a beginning level. There are different types of them. You know? So, but you, know, don't, you don't have to make it a whole huge thing right off the bat. I think I'm getting a sense in my own life as I grow and age that I'm at a point where I sense that I can be learning while I'm sleeping, not just while I'm awake and being alert here. So I'm thinking you were talking possibly to that lucid dreaming, asking for protection in some way prior to sleeping to allow that to happen safely. But actually, dreaming is a very, very important source of information. Absolutely. When, in, uh, when I, in the mid-90s, when email was coming in, I used to give a lecture, dreams call an email from the higher self. Right? <laughs> I, I was very hip. Um, uh, free guys still use it sometimes, you know, but um, as a name of a lecture. But um, dreams are very important. And, you know, Bob's talking about dream yoga. This is one way of working with dreams. But there are many ways to work with dreams. And if you want to cultivate a relationship with your dream life, it, you're exactly right, where you put your attention toward it and uh, really begin to understand that your guidance can be speaking to you through your dreams. And really take your dreams as the guidance and sit down and begin to try to understand them in that way. And, this morning when I was talking about interpreting the images in the journey and the images in dreams, 
one of the ways that you work with your dreams is by learning how to open those images for yourself. Um, and you, you know, for and so what you would want to do if you want to cultivate a dream practice is as you're falling asleep at night, give yourself the suggestion that you will be able to remember either a complete dream or a piece of a dream or even the feeling that you have as you're awakening. Don't feel like you have to have the whole dream in order to receive insight. And then as you're coming awake, just before you, you realize, oh, I'm coming awake, drop back down into where you had just come from rather than continuing out into the room and see if you can perceive where you were, gather whatever part of the dream is still there. And then without getting up, without going to the bathroom, without even turning on the light, record the dream or, or write it down. Because as you all know, it's, as soon as you move, the dream goes. It's really good. So then, and then have a journal that you keep and you look through your dreams, uh, you know, like write your dreams down and then have a moment in your meditation practice where you're looking at your dreams. And one of the things that we do um, in the dreams class is we look at, okay, I can interpret a dream by opening the image. What does this image remind me of? Uh, how do I feel when I'm in the presence of this image? There's a way to open the image. Uh, and um, have, I ever, have I ever seen this image before? These, you know, and what was that context? And, um, and then another way to look at your dreams is to look at the recurring feeling states that are emerging. And then you can take, if you have a journey practice or a Vipassana meditation practice, you can take the feeling state that's arising from the dream and look at it, examine it within the meditative state. And um, this, this is a very important thing to do is to begin to move the information from the dreams into the meditation or the journey or from the meditation and the journey into the dreams. You can send information back and forth in this way. So it, you can, you truly, you know, dreams are a really big part of depth hypnosis. And, you know, I would say that 40% of the individual sessions that I do with anyone are driven by dreams <laughs> because there's so much insight that's coming through them. And and it, it, it's really just a matter of learning the language. And I highly, highly, highly recommend it. It's, it's at your absolutely, your intuition that there's more to learn through your dreams is absolutely correct. She's, she's, right. she's very right and it's very economical. If you work with that kind of uh, instruction, then you can get back into your dreams and your unconscious much quicker than the talking thing. Mm -hmm. So and so many hours, it's so, so much per hour. <laughs> you go much faster with that. No. But it's kind of dream yoga. So it's very economical. Right, no. Can I tell a quick story to end? Of course. Uh, I'm going to tell a story of, I think his name was Kadgapa. I really should have got up one of these days and stop saying, I think. But I believe so. And there was this uh, guy who was um, banished by his family. But Nagarjuna went to this, came to this town, and there was a guy in the cemetery, which isn't a cemetery with gravestones in India, and which with bodies are thrown there, or ashes of people burned who have more money to afford the fire. So it's called the charnel ground. And there was a guy lying in the charnel ground weeping. So Nagarjuna said, what's the matter with you? What he was well dressed, and he was a good looking guy. He said, what's your problem? Why are you weeping? He said, well, the only thing I like to do is sleep. That's the only thing in life that I enjoy, is sleeping. So I do sleep all the time, and my wife, and my mother, and my father, and everyone, they have said to me, if you're going to be comatose, and just act like you're in a coma all the time, why don't you just go ahead of time to the, to the cemetery, or to the charnel ground? <laughs> so they dumped me here, and now I think I might die or something, but, but I can't change, because all I want to do is sleep. <laughs> so then Nagarjuna said, well, that's great, if you could have a, a practice, a teaching, that you could practice by sleeping, would you like that? Oh yes, please teach me that. So then Nagarjuna taught him what they call the mixing, well he initiated him first in a certain mandala, the esoteric community mandala. But then, and then he said, and now in this context you, you must mix your sleep state with the clear light state. So that your sleeping itself, just your seemingly unconscious sleeping is immersion in the clear light. And you're combining the clear light of, 
of uh, samadhi, the clear light of sleeping, and the clear light of death. All is one thing of the clear light of the void, of the Dharma body, the reality body of the Buddha. So all great. So then the guy they, they went to sleep. And then Nagarjuna left, you know, and he slept and slept and slept. And then the people that, you know, his wife tried to sneak out thinking, you know, she'd take him some food and he might die, you know. And they were all waiting for him to reform, you know, to come back and, and eat and be a member of the family. But he just kept sleeping. So she sneaked out and then she was shocked because she saw all these deities like Taras and Dakinis and spirits, you know. And they were there, and they, was, they, were, he, he, they were feasting him in his subtle body, you know. He was asleep, but there was all this going on around him. And, uh, and then after 12 years of sleeping, <laughs> his sleeping body started levitating, and he started floating down the main street of the town. And then without waking up, he started giving like Dharma lectures. <laughs> he started giving depth hypnosis therapy to everybody in the town. While still asleep. I particularly like that because that's a Buddhist version of sleeping your way to Buddhahood. <laughs> <laughs> okay? So have a nice sleep, everyone. Thank you. We need a circle. Circle, circle.